Hey guys, so we've been talking about um, <clears throat> industrial agriculture and um, how we're gonna feed seven billion people. Um, we go into agriculture from the human population unit uh, for a reason. So we need to talk about you know um, uh, human population growth and about Thomas Malthus before we can talk about um, how to feed everybody that's on this planet. So this presentation is um, basically uh, how we're going to feed 7 billion people and um, how we got to the state of agriculture that we're currently in. Thanks. So humans all have to eat, obviously. Um, we are uh, omnivorous creatures and we consume a fair amount of resources in feeding ourselves. Humans need about 2,200 kilocalories per person per day on average. Um, some need less than that, some need more than that. The current global food supply could provide 2,800 kilocalories per person per day if it were equitably distributed. So there's a key theme that runs throughout this presentation that <clears throat> I'm sure you guys have heard of people um, saying, you know, there's not enough food in the world, people are starving. Um, that's actually not true. The current global food supply is more than adequate to feed everybody um, the amount of calories that they need in order to be healthy and survive every day. The problem is that's not equitably distributed. Um, some areas have too much, some areas don't have enough. So um, approximately 850 million people don't have enough to eat. So why is this? Why are we having scarcity issues in some places and obesity problems in others? Well, some of the reasons for unequal distribution of food include political oppression, commodity hoarding, which the US is actually um, very guilty of, price gouging, ditto, and armed conflict. Um, these are reasons why um, people not only cannot grow the food that they need uh, where they need it, but um, they can't. we can't get the food to where it needs to be. So there's a quote here from your textbook, starvation on a global scale is the result of unequal food distribution rather than food scarcity. That is, food exists, but not everyone has access to it. Poverty. Notice how poverty is in all caps and is in red. Poverty is the greatest threat to food security worldwide. Hungry people cannot work their way out of poverty. So once you've, once you've got folks who are living in poverty and they're hungry because they're poor, um, hunger does, does a number on you, man. Um, when you're starving to death, you don't do good work. And um, hungry people can't work themselves out of um, being poor. It's estimated that reducing global hunger could yield more than $120 billion in economic growth produced by longer, healthier, and more productive lives for those 850 million people who are underfed. I mean, that's a lot, right? We could really up everybody's standard of living if we could get everybody enough to eat. So let's talk about famine versus malnourishment. Um, Famine is a large-scale food shortage, uh, massive starvation, and a large number of deaths in a short period of time. Um, it's often often leads to social disruption and economic chaos. Famine is, can be the result of um, severe drought, um, as in some cases in places in Africa. It can be the result of armed conflict, political oppression, but it is um, large-scale food sh shortages. There's lots of starvation and people die. Malnourishment, on the other hand, is a nutritional imbalance caused by the lack of a specific dietary component or the inability to absorb or, or, uh, or utilize these essential nutrients. So if you are in a famine situation, then you are absolutely malnourished because you're, you're lacking specific dietary components. However, developed countries also have large numbers of people who are malnourished. I know, I'm gonna say that again. So you can be of normal weight or actually overweight and still be malnourished. Malnourishment, mal means bad. Um, it just basically means you are not eating the correct balance of nutrients in order to keep yourself healthy. We're gonna go into that more in the next couple of slides. So um, overnourishment is a form of malnourishment. Developed countries consume way too much meat, salt, fat, and far too little fiber, vitamins, and trace minerals. 
64% of Americans are overweight and 33 of those, 33% of those are considered obese, which means 30 uh, or more pounds overweight. Um, this, this number is actually from 2009 and the number of um, cases of obesity has actually gone up. Now, the good news is that the rate of childhood obesity has kind of been stabilizing and even going down a little bit. Um, but we kind of touched on this a little bit when we were watching Food Inc. Uh, they were talking about the fact that biologically, humans are hardwired to seek out salt, fat, and sugar. And um, those tastes are very rare in nature. However, we've engineered our food supply um, so that those tastes are abundant. And so many, many of us are overweight because those are the types of tastes that we seek out. They, they, they provide taste pleasure for us. Um, the result, of course, is overnourishment. And there are all kinds of um, lifestyle diseases that go along with eating too much food. Uh, we talked a little bit about those when we talked about um, diabetes in Food, Inc., but there's other, um, you know, there's other uh, lifestyle diseases that come along with being overnourished. Now, um, apart from overnourishment, when we're talking about strict malnutrition, where people may be getting the calories that they need, um, but they're not getting the correct balance of, you know, protein, um, carbohydrate, fiber. When we're talking about malnutrition, um, these are some of the things that can result from malnutrition. Anemia. Um, anemia is very common. It's low hemoglobin levels in the blood. Um, it's dietary iron deficiency. So it's hard to get iron in the diet if you're not eating iron rich foods. One of those is red meat. Um, many, many people around the world do not have much meat in their diet at all. And they also don't have eggs. So um, if you're not eating meat and eggs, you're probably, uh, you're low on the dietary iron. Low iron increases the risk for maternal hemorrhage during childbirth. Um, this happens a lot in developing nations. People are anemic, and um, when they have a child, they bleed out because um, they cannot the, 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 the blood does not clot right. It is the most common nutritional problem in the world. Notice that that is in red. Um, sources of dietary iron include red meat, eggs, legumes, which are beans, peas, and lentils, and green vegetables. Um, and again, if you don't have access to fresh food or meat or eggs, then you're probably, um, you're probably going to be iron deficient. Goiter is a, um, thyroid problem, thyro uh, thyroid disease. Uh, you may have seen pictures of women in third world countries with very large lumps in their throat. That's a goiter. Um, it's the result of a dietary iron, iodine deficiency, excuse me, iodine deficiency. Um, it causes stunted physical growth, a very swollen thyroid it also causes mental retardation. The problem is the worst in South and Southeast Asia. Um, India has a problem with this, a very big problem with this. Um, the reason why is that the, the normally crops absorb iodine from the soil, but in Southeast Asia, the, uh, the soil is, is very poor in iodine just naturally, and so the crops aren't absorbing the iodine that they need, and so when people are eating the crops from their fields, they're not getting enough iodine. Now, the World Health Organization, um, in, especially in India, has launched lots of um, campaigns to iodize salt in order to put some iodine into the salt that people are using, and that's been very, very um, helpful. Iodine um, deficiency was a much larger problem in the 70s and early 80s than it is now. So um, here in the United States, we don't normally see goiter. Our salt that you buy in the supermarket is iodized, and it has been for many years, so everybody gets enough iodine for the most part here. Childhood blindness is pretty common actually. It's a vitamin A deficiency. Um, cultures that eat a lot of polished white rice tend to have low levels of vitamin A in their diet. Um, and low levels of vitamin A cause childhood blindness. The retina needs vitamin A in order to function correctly. And um, if you don't get it, then you go blind. So there is a product and um, you actually can read about it in a textbook called golden rice. And it's rice that's been genetically modified to have a gene that produces vitamin A. Rice doesn't normally do that. Um, scientists are hoping that golden rice may help deliver vitamin A to vulnerable uh, populations in the future. It, this has not been a, actually golden rice was just in the news the other day. Golden rice has not been a huge success. Um, cultures that are used to eating polished white rice, um, we're not super keen on switching over to golden rice. I think it's 
from what I understand, Golden Rice has had limited limited success, but there's been other ways that um, that the World Health Organization is fighting childhood blindness. Um, neural tube defects. Neural tube defects are anything that affects um, the the development of the closing of the spinal cord, like spina bifida, or any type of um, brain malformation during fetal development. Um, it's the result of a folic acid deficiency. Um, it's actually fairly common even in developed nations. Um, folic acid uh, is, we can take it as a supplement here, but naturally it's found in dark green leafy vegetables and frankly Americans don't eat enough of those. So the effects include microcephaly, which is a, a very small head, the brain doesn't develop correctly, anencephaly, which means a part of the brain, the higher structures of the brain do not um, develop correctly. Um, that usually leads to, to uh, death shortly after birth and pretty severe mental retardation. Um, neural tube defects are, um, if the baby survives them at all, they're, they're kind of life altering. Uh, the child does not have a normal uh, lifespan. And again, um, here in the US, if you become pregnant, um, prenatal vitamins contain folic acid, but you can also take folic acid uh, um, supplements that are separate from prenatal vitamins. But in the developing world, this is hard to get, and so neural tube defects are fairly common. Kwashiorkor is a protein deficiency. Kwashiorkor is an African word. Um, in Africa, a lot of diets are based heavily on grains and legumes, and so protein is hard to come by. Um, what the children, it's, it's generally seen in children. Children end up with this reddish orange hair. They have puffy and discolored skin and a very bloated belly. Um, sometimes when you're seeing pictures of um, children who are in a state of starvation in Africa, what you're seeing is kwashiorkor, which is actually a severe protein deficiency. It's prevalent in many African nations, unfortunately, and children suffer the worst from it. Marasmus is another um, uh, malnutrition disease that is prevalent in African nations. That marasmus is caused by both protein and calorie deficiency. Um, and again, if you have kwashiorkor, you're probably suffering from marasmus as well. Um, so you can have adequate caloric intake and still have kwashiorkor, um, which is protein deficiency. But if you have protein deficiency and inadequate calories, then you're probably suffering from marasmus. Stunted growth, mental retardation, and again, you're gonna have a bloated belly, puffy, discolored skin. Um, it's the result, basically, of chronic undernutrition. Okay, let's talk about meat. Um, I, I wanted you guys to see Food Inc. Um, and kind of understand what a CAFO is and how industrial meat is produced before we um, launched into this discussion. Um, meat is a is a, a dietary resource that we have a lot of in this country. Most developed nations um, have adequate access to meat um, of, of all sources, whether that's red meat or um, poultry or seafood. Um, we can go to the supermarket and buy that. Uh, meat is less common in developing nations because um, the, the meat is usually raised on family farms um, or it's it's too expensive for the poor um, of developing nations to afford. Um, as income increases, however, with economic growth, people tend to add more meat to their diet. Uh, livestock in developed nations like the United States tend to be produced on CAFOs. Uh, we talked about CAFOs when we saw Food Inc. They're concentrated animal feeding operations, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, notice that that doesn't have the word farm in it anywhere. It's not a farm. The animals are produced kind of in a factory-like setting. Um, pretty smelly, pretty dirty. There's all kinds of environmental consequences to that. CAFOs lead to serious air and water pollution because the animal waste is very, very concentrated. Um, if it's not taken care of correctly, it can lead um, to, to pretty severe pollution. The high densities of animals oft also lead to rampant antibiotic use. The misuse of antibiotics is one of the main reasons behind the rise in antibiotic-resistant pathogens, um, also called superbugs. Superbugs have been in the news a lot over the last, mm, basically, decade. Um, pretty much any animal that's raised in a CAFO, whether that is a pig, a cow, or a chicken 
is given antibiotics in their feed. Um, they have to be because they're jammed together so tightly that if one animal gets sick, then the rest of them are gonna get sick too. And the folks who run the CAFOs can't afford to have a bunch of sick animals um, going to slaughter. So um, antibiotics are routinely given to livestock and CAFOs. The problem is, um, I don't know if you remember, there was a chicken farmer that was interviewed in Food Inc. Um, she said because um, the antibiotics are routinely given to livestock, um, the antibiotics pass through um, the feed into the animal's tissue and humans um, can have antibiotic resistance because of that, because of antibiotic residues. Also, um, you know, we talked about natural selection and how um, bacterial populations become resistant to antibiotics. When you use the same antibiotic over and over, the bacteria that are naturally resistant to that antibiotic are the ones that survive and reproduce. And so you end up breeding these um, strains of antibiotic resistant bacteria that are very, very, very dangerous. Uh, again, the little kid in Food Inc., Kevin, who died of an E. coli infection, um, one of the, the very bad strains of E. coli, um, antibiotic resistant, and that strain of E. coli um, evolved b due to uh, the feeding of uh, the corn to livestock, that um, that, that change um, in the, the acidity of the cow's stomach actually allowed this um, very deadly strain of E. coli to proliferate. So, you know, the, co the combined use of antibiotics and the feeding of corn um, to animals on CAFOs um, has given rise to uh, some pathogens that are very, very hard to kill and, um, you know, kind of widespread, not a good thing. So the question is, how did we end up here? How did we end up with people in developed nations being overnourished and obese and people in, under, in uh, developing nations being underfed and malnourished and um, our meat being raised, um, these CAFOs, which have huge environmental consequences. So how do we get here? Well, the agricultural revolution began between 10,000, 12,000 and 10,000 years ago. Um, we began to cultivate crops, humans began to cultivate crops and domesticate animals for human use. Before this, humans were hunters and gatherers. Um, they hunted the meat that they, um, that they needed to survive and they gathered wild plants and tubers and stuff like that. But about 10,000 years ago, we started to uh, manipulate our environment a bit more and we began to settle into um, more sedentary groups, cultivate crops and domesticate animals. The abundance of food that was made possible by this agricultural shift led to the exponential increase of the human population. This was the beginning of human population growth. Now, as you know from our human population unit, um, things did not change rapidly. We still, even in early agricultural communities, we still had births and deaths very high. But being able to settle down and not have a, a, a nomadic lifestyle uh, did lead to population growth. So deliberate cultivation of the land has also led to severe environmental degradation. When human bands uh, were small and they were nomadic and we were roaming around, uh, you just couldn't have a lot of people. Um, people who couldn't walk um, during the seasonal transitions were left behind. Um, infants often died, uh, they weren't cared for. So, you know, you, you had these small uh, bands of human human beings that were, that were pretty mobile. Um, when we settle down in an area, again, we get more food, we produce more humans, and we produce more waste. That means that our waste becomes concentrated, and from that settlement, we have to go move out from the settlement and um, find resources further and further away from our settlement. That leads, obviously, to environmental degradation. And as I've said before, increased food production leads to more people, which leads to the need for more food production, which is a positive feedback loop. So we've talked about feedback loops. There's one for you. Increased food production, leading to more people, leading to the need for more food production, so on and so on. And of course, food production leads to severe environmental degradation. 
So um, the green revolution, this is one that kids miss on the test all the time and I'm not quite sure why. I guess it's possibly because it sounds different than it is. Let's, let's make a, um, a real clear transition. What I just talked about on the previous slide was the agricultural revolution when humans be stopped being for the, for the most part nomadic um, hunters and gatherers and, and began to be agriculturalists, um, settled uh, communities of farmers and herders. The Green Revolution is something that began in the late 1940s in the United States and then began to spread to other developed and developing nations. Um, so this was, the late 1940s was basically when we started to really engineer our food supply um, after World War II. What it was was the deliberate selection and breeding of high yield varieties of cereal crops. Let me tell you very clearly, this, this is not GMOs. We're not doing transgenics in the late 1940s. We didn't even know how DNA worked yet. We didn't even know its structure until 1952. So he, what we're talking about here is in these agricultural um, uh, universities. And I, we talked about it again in Food Inc. He talked about um, these land grant uh, institutions kind of in the in the middle of our country they began purposefully breeding and crossbreeding high yield varieties of cereal crops in order to feed an expanding population um, and to kind of uh, mechanize and standardize our food supply um, this was about the same time that we were standardizing supermarket production we were standardizing um, the beginning of fast food they, they talked about the rise of McDonald's if you can remember that, um, the McDonald brothers kind of, uh, they they put this assembly line mentality that had kind of developed in the early century with Henry Ford and assembly line factories um, and applied that to food production. And that's what we were doing. The green revolution techniques included mechanization, large scale irrigation, and the heavy use of synthetic fertilizers. Um, a lot of the crops that we were developing at this time uh, could not uh, live without lots and lots of human intervention, um, lots of irrigation, lots of synthetic fertilizers. So um, industrial agriculture is sometimes called agribusiness. And again, just like other parts of the American um, economy at the time, industrial agriculture was applying the techniques of the industrial revolution, like mechanization and standardization, you know, kind of assembly line stuff to food production. Uh, it was seen as a very good thing. And frankly, um, again, as we talked about in Food Inc., at the turn of the century, the average farmer could feed about six to eight people. But um, by the 1950s, 1960s, with the rise of these high yield crops, the average farmer could be feed about 160 people. So in absolute terms, being able to feed more people per, per acre of land is a good thing. The problem is, is that, you know, again, there's unintended consequences. So agribusiness is very concerned with what we call economies of scale. What that means is that the average cost of production falls as output increases. So we're looking to increase our output per unit area, in this case, an acre, because that's what we use for farming. So output per acre. And in order to do this, we want to make our farms much larger. So economies of scale favor large farms over small ones. And in fact, the size of the U.S. farm has doubled since 1950. Um, the way that we harvest and the way that we plant is all done by machines. Um, and again, you saw these large machines that were driven by GPS satellite systems and all that kind of stuff. That can't happen on small farms. That is a big farm thing, and that is economy of scale. The, um, the plants are all clones of one another. Um, they're all genetically identical. They're all planted by a machine, which means they're easy to harvest because they're in identical rows. And um, that can really only happen on these very large, um, large farms. Okay, let's talk a little bit about irrigation. We've already talked about groundwater use earlier in the semester. Um, so you guys know that uh, most of the water that we use for agriculture comes from the ground. We take, we suck it up out of the ground and use it to water our crops. Irrigation is essential to modern agriculture. 16% of agricultural land globally is irrigated. 
However, that irrigated land produces 40% of the world's food supply. Um, so again, irrigation is going to uh, happen largely, especially large um, irrigation projects in developed nations um, that can pump that groundwater up and use it uh, systemically. But irrigation has negative consequences, as does everything in apes. Um, irrigation leads to the depletion of groundwater and the depletion of aquifers. Um, we talked about the Ogallala um, being used heavily for agriculture and um, the fact that it will probably run dry by mid-century. Um, the promotion of saltwater intrusion into freshwater wells, which happens mainly in coastal areas. Uh, FYI, that's of course been on as a test question multiple times. You guys have seen that. When we suck the fresh water out of the ground, especially in coastal areas, in order to water our crops or to use for domestic use, um, then the salt water from the, um, from the ocean fills in the gap. Irrigation also con contributes to soil degradation due to water logging and salinization. And again, we've been over this already during our soil unit. Um, water from the ground, groundwater has dissolved salts and minerals in it uh, because it's percolated through the ground. And so when we suck that up and uh, spray it on top of crops, over time, the salts that are in, naturally occurring in that water uh, begin to build up on the surface of the soil. Uh, the problem is that salinization, soil salinization is pretty much an irreversible process. Once that soil has been saline, salinized, it's unusable for agriculture. Um, there's not much you can do with it. Sometimes, if it's not too bad, you can scrape off the salt crust, haul that topsoil away and start again, but it doesn't often work. And, and you can, I mean, you can drive through any farm community and see soil that's been salinized and you can see that the farmers just avoid it. There's nothing you can do with it. Um, you know, of course, you also have the problem with water logging. If your land is not perfectly flat, you'll have some areas that you irrigate that are going to have too much water. And so those, the, you know, the crops, the roots will have too much water around them and won't grow correctly either. And again, this is, I mean, drive through a farm area, you see this. It's, it's very, it's very easy to spot. So all agriculture removes nutrients from the soil. Obviously, plants need nutrients to grow. Um, soil nutrients are a limiting factor for plant growth. And so um, anytime you're uh, having a plant that's sucking up nutrients from the soil, from the soil and then you're harvesting that plant, now the nutrients of course are in the plant, then you're harvesting the plant and then shipping the plant someplace else, you're removing the nutrients from that soil in one ecosystem and shipping it to another. So you've got to somehow replace the nutrients um, in the soil that got sucked up to the, into the plant. So industrial agriculture keeps soil in constant production state. So it requires large amounts of fertilizer to replace the nutrients that are lost every time the plants are harvested. Fertilizers mostly contain nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are limiting agents for plant growth. When I say limiting agent, that's a biological term. That means something that is, uh, that is well, let's go back to last unit. It's a biological limiting factor in a ecosystem. So the, the more natural, naturally occurring nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium in the soil, the greater the plant growth, right? So um, when you add that, you increase plant growth. Um, so again, that's a limiting agent. Industrial agriculture uses mostly synthetic fertilizers. The reason why is because they're cheap and they're fairly easy to produce from fossil fuels. So we're going to talk about that on the next slide. We're going to go through um, what they are and pros and cons. But again, um, just, re just realize that anytime you grow plants um, in an agricultural situation, the plants suck up the nutrients, then the, they're in the plant bodies. You harvest the plant, you take all those nutrients that are in the plant, you ship them to someplace else. So the soil is gonna need to be constantly fertilized in order to keep your plants growing. So let's talk a little bit about synthetic fertilizers um, and what they are and why they're sometimes good and why they're sometimes not so great. So advantages of synthetic fertilizers are here on the left, right? So they're easy to apply. Synthetic fertilizers are usually um, in a liquid, uh, concentrated liquid form that can be diluted with water and sprayed, or they're little pebbles, they're little pellet things. You guys have probably seen miracle Grow from, from Home Depot. It's just this little pellet stuff. Um, they're dry and they can be spread easily. Um, so it's got easy application. 
The nutrient content be, can be targeted to the needs of a specific crop or specific specific soil. You can actually go and buy fertilizer that has different ratios of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus in it, um, depending on your soil type and depending on which type of crops you're growing. So you can um, customize the, um, the fertilizer that you use on your soil. Synthetic fertilizers are readily absorbed by plants, even if the soil is very nutrient poor. So these are designed to be quick acting and the plants and uh, they're in a form that the plants can readily absorb. Synthetic fertilizers have led to huge increases in agricultural production. And again, I think I've told you guys, um, the, the way that we feed people can't be done. Uh, it just can't be done without large scale, um, the large scale use of synthetic fertilizers. The disadvantages of synthetic fertilizers, however, are pretty big too. First off, synthetic fertilizers are made from the combustion of fossil fuels. So we're taking fossil fuels, which we know cause um, air pollution, and we're creating uh, fertilizers out of them. Um, the ease of application of synthetic fertilizers, the fact that they're either um, concentrated liquid or that they're little pebbles, um, contributes to increased eutrophication of waterways because um, this ease of application also leads to a propensity for runoff. So let's just say um, you apply your fertilizer to your crop and it rains heavily the next day. Well, as we know from rain, um, it hits the ground and some of it washes off. Uh, rain flows till it hits the low spot, which is usually a creek um, close to a farm, and all of the fertilizer or a portion of it that you just applied is now in the stream where it's not supposed to be. Um, that's going to lead to eutrophication in, in, that, in that stream ecosystem and that is a problem because eutrophication causes all kinds of water quality issues. The other disadvantage and um, we, we learned about this when we talked about uh, soil. Soil has both biotic and abiotic factors and the biotic factors of soil are just as important as the abiotic factors. Um, you have to support your soil biota and synthetic fertilizers don't, don't um, provide nourishment for the, the living parts of the soil. So um, although your plants are getting their nutrients. The, sto the soil becomes rapidly becomes sterile, meaning that the, the bacteria that is in that soil and the microorganisms that are in there that help, um, pr that help keep the soil healthy for other creatures, those are gone because um, these uh, synthetic fertilizers do not support the living parts of, um, of the, the soil. Okay. So mechanization, irrigation, and synthetic fertilization, which are all parts of the industrial agricultural system, lead to what we call monocropping. And again, whether or not you knew that term, you saw it in Food Inc. You saw it in uh, the so when we, they interviewed the corn and the soybean farmers. Monocropping is, is large plantings of a single species or a single variety of a food crop. This is the way that we farm in the United States. It's the dominant agricultural practice in the US. These plants are easy to plant and easy to harvest because we use large machinery to do it. The plants are genetically identical, which means they all grow to the same height and they're planted by a machine, which means they're all like equally spaced apart and you can just drive your, your harvester and get them all. This greatly improves productivity. And remember, U.S. agriculture is very, very interested in economies of scale. So that's what we want to do. But it also increases soil erosion and it makes crops more vulnerable to pests and changing climatic conditions. Um, this right here has actually been a test question before. Um, what would be the impact of a change in climatic conditions such as global warming on the U.S. food supply? Well, if you've engineered your crops to um, thrive under certain climatic conditions and those climatic conditions change, then you're going to have to um, do something about that. Um, the other thing about the pests, and we're going to talk more about this when we talk about um, the pesticide treadmill and integrated pest management, is when you have a food crop where every single plant is genetically identical, when a pest learns to unlock the genome of one plant and exploit that plant, 
that every single plant in your field can be exploited the same way because they have the exact same genome. So um, the vulnerability to pests is a big, big, big problem with monocropping. Ah, here we go. So because monocropping encourages increased pest populations, we also need to apply pesticides. Pesticides in order to kill the pests that might unlock the genome and exploit our monocrop genetically identical crops. So pesticides come in a couple of different flavors. Um, broad spectrum pesticides kill many different kinds of animals or plants. Um, they are, um, you can buy them. They're, they're easily, they're, they're widespread. So if you go to the um, hardware store and you say, um, let's see, I want to get a, um, a product that's going to kill a bunch of different weeds. It's going to kill, you know, whatever's eating my tomato plants. You can get that. It's called a broad spectrum pesticide. Um, seven dust, uh, Roundup. Those are broad, broad spectrum pesticides. You can also get selective pest pesticides, which focuses on a single pest or a narrow range of pests. Um, pesticides can include insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides, yes, kill rodents. Um, pesticides can be persistent in the environment, which leads to bioaccumulation, or non-persistent, meaning that they break down very quickly into uh, components that are not harmful to the environment. Okay, so again, there's a reason that we do this unit after we do our population unit. Pests are our strategists. Um, remember, our strategists tend to have exponential growth. Um, they are niche generalists, meaning that they can um, live in many different places. They have significant genetic diversity. They reproduce rapidly, uh, and their populations can grow quite large. Some individuals of a pest population will always be resistant to a pesticide, always. That's one of the, the founding ideas of natural selection. Some individuals will always be resistant. And remember, uh, because pests, uh, because of their biological makeup and their rapid reproduction, they do have significant genetic diversity, which means that, you know, maybe up to 20% of those pests are gonna be resistant to the pesticide that you just used. Over time and with more pesticide use, natural selection is going to ensure that these resistant individuals are going to make up a greater and greater percentage of the population. I've talked about this twice already in this presentation. Um, when we talked about antibiotic resistant superbugs in CAFOs, if you are dosing bacteria with the same antibiotic over and over, the only ones that are going to survive are the ones that are resistant to that, back, to that antibiotic and those are the ones that are gonna reproduce. So you get these um, antibiotic resistant bacteria over time. So the, um, the uh, overuse of pesticide um, is going to lead to the application of either a more concentrated pesticide or more of the same pesticide, or the development of a new pesticide, um, which, and then the cycle begins again. So. Um, again, you're using your pesticide and um, you're using it, you know, over and over. So the only individuals that are surviving the use of the pesticide are the pesticide resistant ones. So those are the ones that are surviving to reproduce. And over time, we'll end up with a population of pests that aren't, is that where the pesticide is no longer effective. And then you're going to have to either develop a new pesticide um, or do a more concentrated pesticide and you end up with this uh, very, very negative detrimental cycle, which we call the pesticide treadmill. Because if you continue to use pesticides in the same way, um, even the new pesticide, uh, your pests are going to become um, resistant to. And by the way, that same idea of dosing, dosing, dosing with pesticides and having the, the um, resistant ones survive to reproduce is the same idea with antibiotic resistance. If you keep dosing, 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 then eventually whatever you use to try to kill them, they're going to be resistant to. Okay, GMOs. Now remember, I was talking to you earlier in the gr about the green revolution. During the green revolution, we were doing selective breeding of high yield cereal crops. The reason I'm saying it that way is because that is the way the test is going to say it to you. The green revolution was selective breeding of high yield cereal crops. 
Now we're moving into genetically modified organisms. This is a different thing. GMOs are transgenic. That means that those organisms contain a gene or genes from another organism as well as their own. We've touched on this just briefly, but we're gonna go into it more now. GMOs can be plants, they can also be animals. Um, we talked, um, when we saw Food Inc, we were talking about the fact that um, almost, well, more than 90% of the US soybean crop is now GMO, transgenic, and um, the corn crops as well. Both of those, uh, those genomes are owned by the company Monsanto. Genetic engineering has the potential to increase crop yield and crop quality, as well as to reduce malnutrition because genetically engineered crops um, produce more per acre and um, can feed more people. Not all genetically engineered plants are animals or GMOs, however. And again, so we're talking about the fact that um, when we talk about um, genetic engineering, um, they, we can be doing high yield breeding techniques. Um, to be a GMO, the organism has to be transgenic. Okay, so GMOs account for about 63% of the US corn crop. Um, that number's a little bit higher now. I think we're about up to 70 now. 91% of soybeans, which is about where we currently stand still, and about 71% of cotton in the United States. Um, so if GMOs can reduce malnutrition and increase crop yields, then why do people have such a negative reaction to GMOs? Well, the first thing is that they've never been test tested for safety for human consumption. Now we've been eating them for about 10 years now um, and no one has specifically said that there's been any safety concerns in terms of humans eating them. However, no one also asked the U.S. population if they were cool with having transgenic crops um, being planted and fed to them. It's kind of a giant, uncontrolled experiment, and we really don't know the outcome of that. There are significant negative effects that have been documented on biodiversity. Again, GMOs are, cl are clones of one another, so when you plant, when you're doing this monocropping and you're planting plants that are genetically identical, um, you're greatly reducing biodiversity. Those fields have no biodiversity. It's the same plant planted over and over and over. We also have potential for hybridization with native species. Um, again, you saw this in Food Inc. with the soybean farmer who did not plant Monsanto soybeans, which are GMO, but his crops became hybridized um, through wind pollen pollinization, pollination, pollination. <laughs> Um, with his non-GMO soybeans. So, um, you know, plants propagate uh, via the wind, and so we end up with the potential for hybridization where we don't want it. Um, and again, also, if, you're, um, if these seeds are hybridizing with native species, then again, of course, you're reducing biodiversity. We also have the very significant um, issue of the social justice aspect of the patenting of GMO seed. Um, this is the first time that a company has been able to own the rights to life. They developed these, um, these transgenic organisms. Um, they developed their genome in the lab. And so they technically own the right to the life of that plant or animal. So Monsanto's the biggest one that owns these, the rights to these, um, these patented seeds. And again, like, is this cool? Is this what is this where we want to be? Um, there's a social justice issue there. Should we have our food supply owned by a single corporation, which is largely what it is in the U.S.? What if that corporation decided to, you know, hold those seeds hostage one year or jack up the prices? Um, you know, that's that's a real possibility. Okay, so is it possible to produce enough food to feed the world's population without destroying the land? polluting the environment, or reducing biodiversity? That's the central question here, right? So right now, again, we have a global food supply that can feed the world's population, um, our current global food supply, if it were equitably distributed. But we are also destroying the land, polluting the environment, and reducing biodiversity while we do it. So is it possible to feed who we've got, 7 billion people, without doing this? So let's talk about sustainable agriculture. This is ways that we could feed these 7 billion people, right? 
without harming our own um, ecological systems that keep us alive. So sustainable agriculture draws on methods um, of traditional subsistence agricultural practices, but modifies them. One of the ideas in sustainable um, agriculture is what we call intercropping. These are two or more crops that are planted together to, produce, to promote a synergistic reaction between them. One of the biggest ones is corn crops. <coughs> Excuse me. Corn requires a lot of nitrogen, a lot of nitrogen in order to grow correctly. Um, and as you know from uh, biology and from when we talked about soil um, earlier in the year, there are certain crops that have specifically leg leguminous crops like peas, beans, and lentils that have root nodules that um, have bacteria in them that actually fix nitrogen. So like if you plant corn in your field for one season, which sucks up all the nitrogen, but then the next season you plant peas, which are nitrogen fixing, then you can increase your soil nitrogen without having to add fertilizer. So then you harvest the peas and the soil nitrogen is left behind. And then you plant your corn again, which sucks all the nitrogen out of the soil. And then you plant peas, which fixes more nitrogen and so on. That reduces your need to add synthetic fertilizer to the soil. So that is intercropping. Crop rotation is another um, sustainable agricultural method. Um, I point, I tried to point it out to you guys when we were watching Food Inc. Uh, Joel Salatin on Polyface Farms. He was moving his cattle from one field that had been heavily grazed into another field that had long, tall, lush grass. That's crop rotation. So you're planting a rotating crop species in a field from season to season, and you're letting the other parts of that field lie fast. If you've never heard that word, it's F-A-L-L-O-W. That means that you're letting it rest and you're not producing. Letting a field lie fallow allows the nutrients um, to recover and allows the soil to recover in between crop plantings. So um, farms that practice sustainable, sustainable agriculture will um, usually rotate in a three-year cycle. So you're planting a third of your land at one time and letting the other two lie fallow. Um, this keeps the soil um, healthy. Agroforestry is another um, sustainable agricultural technique. It is intercropping trees with other crops. Um, this is actually often done in co on coffee plantations. Uh, the best coffee is produced in the shade, not in direct sunlight. And so um, in order to keep forests intact in the developing world, which is where most of the coffee is grown, um, and to produce good crops, good coffee, agroforestry is um, encouraged and you're basically planting your coffee bushes in the shade under trees. Um, this promotes um, keeping forests intact, so uh, reduces deforestation and also produces great crops which are grown in the shade. So another sustainable agricultural technique. Contour plowing. Counter plowing is plowing parallel to the topography of the land. Um, you've heard the, the term contour plowing before because we used it when we talked about um, uh, ways to reduce soil erosion. Contour plowing also reduces soil pollution, uh, excuse me, soil erosion. Um, but uh, because it reduces soil erosion, it's a sustainable agricultural technique because soil erosion leads to the loss of topsoil and whatnot. So keeping your topsoil there um, keeps your soil healthier. No-till or low-till agricultural techniques. Again, we, we touched on these briefly when we talked in our soil unit. Um, if you are not tilling your soil, tilling your soil um, is where you take that, um, the A layer and you turn it over and you mix it with the O layer. So you're mixing your topsoil and then your O layer, which is your organic horizon. Um, there's reasons that you don't want to do this. The organic horizon has the, the uh, material that is decomposing, which that's good stuff. You want to mix it in. However, that A horizon, when you um, flip it over and you expose it to the air, it oxidizes quickly. It also uh, desiccates, which means it dries out and your topsoil can then blow away. The loss of topsoil is a major agricultural problem. So if you're not tilling, then you're conserving your topsoil um, as well as conserving your organic material. So no-till or low-till agriculture is a sustainable agricultural technique. IPM, integrated pest management. We will talk more about this in a different presentation and um, in class as well. 
Integrated pest management is um, the use of biological um, pest management um, and mechanical techniques, meaning like we're picking things off or vacuuming the pests off rather than the heavy use of pesticides. Now, it doesn't mean that no pesticides are used, but pesticides are used kind of as a last resort. So we're trying other things first. Um, the use of organic fertilizers and pesticides rather than synthetics. Again, um, organic fertilizers have some benefits. They, um, they nourish your soil biota. Um, they're not made with fossil fuels. They're naturally produced um, uh, by usually um, by cows through the butts of cows or pigs. And um, they are not there, although there's nitrogen in, in them, um, that nitrogen breaks down quite a bit more quickly. Um, and they're, they're not as prone to the runoff problems of synthetic fertilizers. Uh, for the free range production of meat rather than the CAFO production of meat. You saw this again on um, Joel Salatin's farm. Uh, the cows were moved from field to field. The pigs were running around all over the place. The chickens were running around all over the place. Um, that is not a CAFO, that's a farm. Um, that production of meat is more labor intensive and it is also more expensive, but it's better for the environment and it's better for the animal. And then the strict protection of wild fisheries with trees and legislation. We have not talked about fisheries management yet, but we will. Um, a lot of our oceans have been overfished. Uh, and part of that's due to the fact that we don't have good laws in place. And part of that's due to the fact that we don't enforce the laws that we do have. So we have uh, a law like the 1996 Sustainable Fisheries Act. We have ITQs, which are individual transferable quotas. And don't worry, we'll talk more about this later. You're actually going to do a lab on all of this stuff. But um, in order to protect our fisheries and to ensure that there is enough breeding stock of our wild fish in the future, um, we need to... Um, we need to enforce the, um, the legislation and the treaties that we currently have on the books for protecting our fish stock. And last but not least, let's talk about aquaculture. So fish and shellfish, um, they can either be caught wild or they can be farmed. Yes, fish can be farmed. Uh, aquaculture is the farming of aquatic organisms such as fish, shellfish, and seaweed. Aquaculture is controversial because it has the potential, like I swear I say aquaculture is controversial. Everything in apes is controversial, right? Um, aquaculture has the potential to reduce human pressure on overexploited fisheries, like wild fisheries. However, it also creates um, environmental problems. And frankly, aquaculture is like a CAFO for fish. Okay, it's not good to jam animals, um, you know, side by side, standing in their own poop um, in a CAFO. We know this. It causes all kinds of environmental and health issues. But the same is true with aquaculture. So the pumping of wastewater contaminated with feces, antibiotic residues, and uneaten food out of these fish enclosures into the wild is a huge problem. You can you can imagine that. I mean, that's pollution. So. If you jam a whole bunch of animals in the, in the same place, they poop and they pee in that same place. Well, when you pump that wastewater out, when you're with, you know, when you uh, pump the water through these enclosures, um, the fish poop and pee go out there. Um, <clears throat> just like in, in land or terrestrial CAFOs, um, you have to feed the fish high levels of antibiotics in order for them not to get sick because they're jammed so close together. Uh, also, you know, the food is dumped into the enclosure. Um, any uneaten food also gets washed out into the ecosystem. And as we talked about again in Food Inc., we're now feeding fish on fish farms corn. Corn is not something that fish are engineered to eat. So, um, you know, giving these fish, this, these corn-based fish meal, uh, it's just got all kinds of environmental uh, consequences. Um, the wastewater that comes out of the fish enclosures uh, uh, contains high levels of bacteria, viruses, and other pests that tend to thrive in these high-density aquaculture environments. Um, you know, again, it's you're washing out um, heavily polluted water um, into um, natural areas. Aquaculture requires the destruction of native habitats, um, especially stuff like Southeast Asian mangroves to clear waterways and aquaculture pens. We talked about mangrove swamps when we talked about, um, in my biome present presentation, I talked about the, the critical importance of mangroves, mangrove swamps and mangrove roots 
to the, um, the incubation of fish species along the coast. Uh, mangrove roots are used as fish nurseries and also uh, to keep the um, erosion at bay, um, you know, the erosion of coastal land. And the third thing mangroves do is that when there's a, a tidal surge or a tsunami, they um, lessen the impact because they absorb some of the energy from the storm. When you remove mangrove, um, mangrove swamps in order to uh, produce aquaculture, you're removing like all of those criti critically important environmental um, uh, services that mangroves provide. So, you know, you're more prone to, uh, you're, you're lessening biodiversity because now the native fish have nowhere to breed and to raise their young. Um, you're increasing soil erosion on coastal areas and you're, um, you're basically uh, uh, increasing the damage that a coastal storm is going to have on your community um, because when, the, when these large waves hit, there's nothing to absorb the, the impact of the wave. Um, the escape of farmed species from these aquaculture pens uh, is also an issue. Uh, fish get out, and they do it all the time. Like, you don't want to talk about unintended consequences. Um, when we saw the, the video on invasive species with the Asian silver carp um, in the Illinois River, how they've kind of taken over, um, those fish weren't put there on purpose. They escaped from fish farms. Um, they were brought in to eat algae and they escaped. Fish are really good at doing this. So these farmed species um, tend to be cloned animals. Um, they are not the same species as native species. So when these fish escape or when, you know, these aquatic organisms escape, they tend to interbreed with um, native wild populations and they compete with the wild native species, which is exactly what we saw with that invasive um, silver carp in the Illinois River. Um, this is a huge, obviously a huge, huge issue. So um, lionfish, we saw the same thing. Um, anytime we get a non-native species that's introduced into the wild, it can outcompete, but it all, can also interbreed and screw up the biodiversity and the, the trophic levels of an ecosystem. Yay!